Good evening, and God bless you this wonderful Wednesday. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to share with you. And welcome to our Fellowship Covenant virtual Wednesday evening Bible study session on August 4th. And it's an honor and a privilege to have this time with you. Amen. And we welcome our visitors, our friends, wherever you are tuning in tonight. We are just so grateful to have this technology where we can so share God's word together. And before we begin anything tonight, I want to I want to take a moment. Let's have a word of prayer and let's agree tonight that God's divine hand and providence will continue to reign in our lives. If there was ever a time in our lives, I don't think anyone would disagree if there was ever a time in our lives where we needed to be prayerful and we needed to hear God's word. These are the times we are living in wicked, violent, amen, corrupt times today. We're seeing this pervasive new virus, virus coming out and multitudes again are being hospitalized or being diagnosed with this sickness. We need prayer. If there was ever a time when the people of God need to assemble themselves together in their quiet places, in their secret closets, all the foolishness is trying to distract us, we need prayer. Amen. So join me now. And let's stop everything we're doing. Let's put everything else at rest. Amen. If this, these last 18 months have corrected anything, they should have corrected our lackadaisical, our compromising position, and prioritized our time with God. Amen. Our private and our public worship. Amen. God is calling us to a new level. And join me now in prayer as you stop all your other activities. Let's bow our heads. Let's invite the Lord into our rooms, into our hearts, into our minds. Amen. And invite him to open up our understanding. We can understand and embrace God's word. Father, tonight, we thank you. Father, we bless you. Father, we magnify your precious name. Thank you, Lord. For another opportunity to join our brethren and sisters, oh God, near and far in this time of fellowship. And thank you for letting us enter into your presence, for keeping us as the apple of your eye in the midst of a pandemic that's relentless, oh God, that's consistent, that has continued to resist all man-made formulas. We know that our hope and our trust is only in you tonight, Lord. You are the God who reigns. You are sovereign. You can speak life even in rooms of darkness and death. You still reign today. And you commanded us, oh God, to be people of prayer, not foolishness, not distractions, not multiple gods, but to serve you, the Lord our God, and you only will we serve. God, we pray for your healing. We pray for your mercy for mercy on this country, on mercy on this world, even in the pandemic, Lord, have mercy, God. Mercy tonight, we pray. Oh, God, those making decisions, doctors and scientists, guide and govern them and guide your people to be lights, to bring hope, to bring understanding in the times of darkness, in the name of Jesus. We pray for this devoted time now, Father. We're dedicated to you, not multiple tasking, not trying to do things, Lord, but to singly give you our hearts, our minds, and our full attention to learn from your word, from your prophets, from the power of the Spirit of God that enlighten and open us up today, Father, we pray. Let this not just be a ritual or a tradition, but let it be a discipline that you use to develop and construct in us the character and the image of your Savior, your Son, in our lives. And we thank you today, Father. Have your way now. Bless our efforts. Bless the words coming forth out of our mouths in the thoughts of our minds today. Be praised, be glorified, and be exalted now, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank God for you again. We're going to dive into the book of Micah. Now, our study tonight is going to be a little different. We're going to spend about 30 minutes, 35 minutes max, on the summarizing what we've been studying about Micah, 
We're going to introduce and clear up the sixth chapter of Micah. But then we're also going to end the teaching part of this with an opportunity for you all to be introduced to a whole new revelation of understanding that we're learning about social justice. And I might say social injustice, okay, in society today. So I prepared, with the help of our media team, a video clip of I think is a, just a, 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 an amazing history, amazing story of what's happened in America just in the last 10, 20 years. Now this is going to be a documentary, it's on PBS, but we've got a piece for you to watch tonight at the end of our teaching session, you're going to observe it. And our media team has put together craftily, put together a snippet of it for you to learn from. But I want you to see and understand this thing, okay? This, what you're going to watch later on, is a clipping that will give you about what's been happening in our America in the last 10, 15 years. Not 1960, not 1950, not 1890, but in this present time, what's happening, and to show you up front the maneuvering and the, and the deception of what injustice can do to a country that will not submit and render their hearts to God. I want to watch that. But first, let's wrap up Micah. We're going to go through a quick review here, and then we're going to go a little bit into the sixth chapter. We're going to dive right into this wonderful clip that we have to share with you tonight. Okay, so pay attention. Get your Bibles out, glasses out. Amen. Tell folk, don't bother me right now. I'm learning God's Word. I'm going to hear what God has to say. I'm going to receive the Spirit of God's wisdom and direction. Because the unfolding of His words give what? Light. Praise God, understanding to the simple. Now, here's what he says. Micah, we know, is the word of the Lord came to Micah, who's a Morshite, right? He was down in the southern part of the kingdom, also known as Jerusalem region. He's a prophet who prophesied during the time of these kings. He prophesied during Jothan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And he prophesied also concerning things that were going to happen in Samaria, which is the northern kingdom, and Jerusalem, which is the southern kingdom. We said, right, all along, that the capital of the northern kingdom is Samaria. The capital of the southern kingdom is Judah. So Micah had a broad message concerning Samaria, northern kingdom, and concerning Jerusalem. Now, primarily Micah was the Morshite, the prophet who was remembered. His primary audience was the southern kingdom, okay? We don't know his occupation. We just know that his name means who is like the Lord, okay? And we're going to get into that a little bit toward the end. But remember this, Micah is known as the prophet who was remembered. Why do we know that? Because and Jeremiah, one time, they were, about a hundred years later, now Micah takes place, and about a hundred years later, there's another prophet known as what? Known as Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, the exact words of Micah, which is prophesied 100 years prior to Jeremiah, are communicated. In fact, one of the members of the audience of Jeremiah said, did not Micah the prophet say this to Hezekiah the king, and did not God spare Hezekiah's kingdom? Yes. So what we know now is that Micah proclaimed something, corrected Hezekiah, Hezekiah obeyed it, and because of that, God preserved Hezekiah's reign so the destruction would not come during his time. Okay, it's important to keep that in mind. So Micah is the prophet who proclaims himself to be a man filled with power and with the spirit of the Lord. He is a prophet, notice he says this, with justice and that he might declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sins. So Micah says, listen, Israel and Jacob, I'm going to declare to you your sins. Now, if he stopped right there, we'd be scratching our heads saying, well, what was their sin? We know they have sinned because he says sin and transgression. But Micah comes boldly and says, as a prophet of justice and might, I'm going to declare to Jacob, 
which is southern kingdom, to Israel, the northern kingdom, their sins and their transgressions. That was Micah's mantra. I'm going to clarify. You're going to know just what it is. You're not going to have to guess. You're not going to have to wonder. I'm going to declare this to you, what the transgressions are. So what we looked at this book in three different cycles, right? Three cycles. The first cycle we did in week number two, that was chapters one through chapter two. The second cycle we did week three, which was last two weeks ago, right? We skipped last week because we had, we had some challenges and I was not physically up to it. So we postponed last week to this week. And now we're going to wrap up cycle number three, which is the sixth chapter of Micah. And we'll conclude the whole book. And tonight will be our final night on Micah. And then next week we'll go to another prophet. We can't wait to hear and learn about the prophet Nahum. Okay, so let's look at the wrap-up now. The review from last week, okay? The review, I'm saying last week, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize one more time, okay? When I say review, I'm referring to lesson number three, and that took place on July 21st. There was no Bible study on July 28th. As I mentioned to you before, I had some physical challenges. So we are back at it tonight. Praise God. Feeling strong. Amen. The effectual, fervent prayer of God's people availeth much. I'm grateful to be here. And I got my media team here pressing the way forward with me as well. I love and appreciate them. So now, I began lesson three by giving us an understanding of the government. And I use the current government structure to give us the clear understanding of what I wanted to articulate. These three branches of government are in place to ensure the laws are fulfilled, that citizens are protected, that decisions are made, that there is accountability, that there is authority, and there is responsibility. We have the executive branch, which, was, which is considered the president. We have the legislative branch, which is Congress and senators, right? And then we have the judicial branch, which is the, the law of the land, the Supreme Court, and the other judges that fall underneath that. Now, what I'm going to put this up to you right now is understand this. Remember this, write this down. When you go to your prayer time, you have your quiet prayer time, your private prayer time, I want you to pray for all three branches of government. Pray for the executive branch. Pray for the legislative branch. Pray for the judicial branch. Pray that God's spirit would influence the minds of those people in those seats, in those offices who have been elected, who have been appointed, who have been assigned to fulfill a certain purpose. Pray for them. Amen. Let's not sit around and criticize them. Let's pray that God's spirit would move in their lives and transform their understanding. Amen. So you're going to pray for the executive branch, legislative branch, and judicial branch. Pray for those, Paul says, who have authority over you. So that's how our government today is structured. We got that. So now, if you take that understanding and equivalize that to the time of the Old Testament in, God, in, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, there were three forms of government also. There was a high priest, there was the king, and there was the prophet. All three of them have a responsibility. The primary role of the high priest was to teach God's law because the law was given originally to the Levites, amen, and the Levites were told to make sure that the people adhered to the law. And they were God's priests. They were God's interveners. They were the gap between God and humanity was the priests who were before God to make intercession for the people. That's why the Bible calls you and I today New Testament priests. We are to intervene ought to be light. We ought to bring understanding to people regarding what? What the word of the Lord says. So you have the high priest in the Old Testament. Then you have the king. The king actually came after 
the priest. Because before there was king, God was speaking through individuals to guide the people, like Samuel or Joshua or Moses. But unfortunately, people rebelled and said, no, give us a king. So God appointed kings to make sure that the role, that the responsibilities of the word of God were being adhered to in where? In the kingdom. So the king was like the executive branch. They made sure that the laws and the, and the utterances of the priests were being executed and people were conducting themselves in a way that was pleasing unto God. And then you have the prophet. Out of all three of those roles, before there was a high priest or a king, God always had a prophet. Now, the prophet, the first one we know about was Abraham. Abraham served in the role of the prophet in that he told people what God said. Okay? He broke down the word of God. He was the first one. Moses was considered a prophet also. All of these individuals who stand between humanity and God, who God speaks to, and they say, thus saith the Lord, serve in the role of prophet. So likewise, all throughout the Old Testament, from the book of Samuel all the way down to Malachi, we have examples of priests, kings, and prophets. Now, when the nation went south, when they stopped obeying God's word, we see a common thread. The common thread is that the government, the leadership, aborted God's plan and went in a different direction. How do we know this? Micah says in 3 and 1, he says, listen, who is Micah proclaiming the sin to? Micah is saying to who? He's saying to the rulers, the kings, the heads, the priests of the house of Israel, should you not know justice? Understand this. The purpose of these people, kings, priests, and prophets was to ensure that justice was being served, that people were being treated equitably, they were being treated fairly, that they were not, no one was using their power over others to put them in oppression, to bind them, to make them less than what they were intended to be. God always intended to build his kingdom on the foundation of righteousness and justice and anyone serving in leadership was responsible to ensure that justice was being served so Micah throws out this rhetorical question and he says shouldn't you know justice you guys who are in charge you guys who are leaders shouldn't you know this and he goes on and he says in the next verse in chapter 3 and verse 2 he says you Leaders, you actually hate the good and love the evil. Matter of fact, he says, you're tearing the skin off of my people. Now, I want to understand the word my people. The word my is underlined to emphasize the fact they're referring to the people of God. God has never condoned anyone oppressing a man or punishing his people. He put leaders in place to take care of his people. And when they don't, they have violated their role, and that creates the anger, and that creates, amen, the wrath of God. Now keep in mind this too. The folk could say, no, we won't do wrong, but when they follow the leader, as many do, and there is no leader doing right, what happens is not only the leaders become corrupt, but all the people become corrupt also. So Micah goes in chapter number 3 and verse 3, he says, listen, you eat the flesh of my people. So you hear two common words here, flay their skin, and we said also tear their, tear their skin. Two common words are mentioned there. So metaphorically, it gives us an idea of something important here. What does it mean to tear, to flay the skin of others, to chop them up like meat? Hey Amen. Here's what it means. Let's look at this slide. It defines it for us. Whenever you see the word, metaphorically speaking of tear the skin off of someone or flay their skin off, eating people, eating their flesh is a common expression and what it means is what? You are oppressing people, okay? You are oppressing people. We see that proverb says in Proverbs 30 and 14, Solomon said, he says, there is a generation whose teeth 
are swords, whose fangs are knives, who devour, oppress the land and needy from mankind. So he's saying in essence that these are people who are vultures, okay, who are sapping the life out of people. So in summary, chapter 3, verse 11, the slide in front of you right now says that the, the, the challenge is this. The rulers who are responsible for giving good judgment will give their judgment for a bribe. The priests who are responsible to teach will teach and say what you want them to say for a price. The prophets will prophesy, thus saith the Lord, Whatever you want me to say, I'll say it for what? For money. So for a bribe, the kings give in. For a price, the priests give in. And for money, the prophets give in. And then all of them fall back on the cushion of saying, wait a minute. God's with us. We are his chosen people. We have a covenant with him. He's not going to let any harm come upon us. Now keep in mind, they've sown corruption but they expect to reap prosperity. They expect to reap protection. They've sown disobedience and ungodliness, but they expect to receive in return something good. So they lean back on the word of God when they need it to say, hey, listen, we are leaders, but God ultimately will make sure that no harm comes upon us. So, we understand that predicament they were in, and Micah comes to proclaim against that. He comes to say, listen, rulers, priests, prophets, you're all on the take. You're all for bribe, corruption, and you will give account for what you are doing. Okay, let's go to our next one there. So we look at that understanding of this important concept. Okay, eating the flesh, we talked about what that means. Okay, now, what other thing is happening, I want to go to the next slide. Another thing that's happening here is very important is this. He gives us a summary. Okay, the summary that he gives us. You have the rulers, the kings, the priests, and the prophets. That's the summation of each of them. Then I want to bring you to a very important point here, this next slide. Again, it's about money. And here's how the evilness of those in leadership transfers to the common person. Now, if the priests, the kings, and the prophets are all on the take, and they get workers to work for them, those who work for them will also pervert and do wicked things. Which is why Micah says in chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, he says, hear this, rulers of the house of Jacob and chiefs of the house of Israel, okay? You hate justice. You pervert equity. Now look what he says here. He says, who built Jerusalem with blood, and Zion with blood, and Jerusalem with wrong. Here's what he's saying. Because the leaders are corrupt, they get workers to work for them to execute their convoluted and deceitful plans and in so doing, they use that to build up equity and, and, and economic strength for themselves. And I gave you this picture last time of a skyline. Here's what Micah is saying. All this prosperity going on in Jerusalem, all this growth, all these new buildings, all these new housing complex, all these new businesses, all these new transit systems that you have built, you have built it on the blood of the people. Which basically means this, you have displaced the common person, you've evicted them from their premise, you've made them work for nothing, lower than the minimum wage, the average worker is living below the minimum wage, they can't feed their families, child poverty is at an all-time high, but guess what, we got new cities, we got new buildings, we got new institutions, we got new transit systems, but the people who have to use those systems can't even afford to use them because you've built it on their backs. That's what Micah is saying, and he's proclaiming against this injustice. That's the word of God from Micah. And Micah picks up, and Isaiah says this, he says, who we quit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of justice. When you deprive the innocent of justice, it's saying this, 
you are equivalent saying this, that people who have a right to be treated fairly are experiencing the opposite of that. They are experiencing instead injustice, barely able to eat, live comfortably. At the same time, you're making money from them, but they're not getting what they're putting into it. Okay? In, in other words, the rich are tilting the scales in their favor. And the more we work, the less we have to get anything balanced. So we lose out what God intended for us to have. And that's the condition of what's happening during Micah's time. And nothing depicts that more than what Isaiah says here. He says, stop doing this evil. Learn to do good. Aim at justice. Correct oppression. Defend the orphan. Take the widow's side. Hate evil and love good. Maintain justice in the gate. Now, when you see the word gate, it's important to underline that. Whenever you see the word gate, gate was always the entrance to the city. At the entrance of the city, that's where the authorities sat. That's where the laws were made. That's where decisions were made. That's where rules were created. So when you say maintain justice at the gate, what that is in essence saying is what? Maintain justice at the Capitol. Maintain justice in City Hall. Maintain justice in the Supreme Court. Because at the gate is where they're making decisions. Let justice be amen, declared there and then it will it will trickle down across the entire society. But if the justice is not being held up at the gate, at their places of authority, we're going to see wickedness across the whole throne. And this is why we put this slide in to understand this, that God always intended to use these three vehicles to ensure that justice was being served. Kings, priests, and prophets. Likewise, in our day and time, God has allowed this country to institutionalize and structure the government around what? Executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch, to ensure that justice is served, that people are being treated properly, that people are being treated with equi equi equity, okay, equitably being treated. That was always the intention of God's plan. We got that? Very important. So these officials, unfortunately, they didn't prize that. So that summarizes cycle number two. Cycle number three, briefly, in a couple of minutes here, I want to look at that one for us now. Cycle number three says this. It begins with a courtroom scene. You see the courtroom? On our next slide, because here's the deal. After Micah has taken us all through the current condition of Israel, and what's going on? He says, okay, now God has a complaint. He says, listen, the Lord's got a complaint. His complaint means this. He is a covenant God. We had an agreement. God established a covenant with his people. His people broke the covenant. Because of that, God is in essence metaphorically saying, I got a case. I have a charge against you. Let's go to court. And here's on the witness stand, the jury box will be the following. Look at what he says in the next verse. He says the jury box will be what? The mountains will stand and the hills will stand to hear the voice of God. Because they've seen my actions from the very beginning. They've seen how I delivered you. And now let them serve as a jury. You are, I am the plaintiff, and you are, you are the, in the, the victim. You are the person on trial. So you're on trial. I'm bringing my case against you, in Micah's, in Micah's metaphorically speech, and the king and the hills and the mountains will declare whether or not my case is, ver is, is legitimate. So it's called prophetic litigation. Hear you mountains, the indictment of God. I am Yahweh. Yahweh has an indictment. He's endured with you. He's pressed his way for you. But you have violated my ordinances. You have broken my covenant. So now I'm bringing you to court. Before I break the covenant, I will have a jury say you have every right to do it. Because God's a just God. So we see that happening in Micah 6 and 2. Micah 6 and 4, he says, I brought you from the land of Egypt. 
I've done great things for you. And here's the deal. He says this. He says, I have even set before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, why does God bring up the first three leaders of the nation of Israel? He does that because he wants them to understand this. Understand that when I appointed leaders for you, they were of the character and the caliber of Moses, of Aaron, of Miriam. They were not perfect. But what they were is that they honored my word. They honored my word. They failed at many different times, but they honored my word. So now you have picked leaders who do everything with the opposite of what these leaders have done. I gave you the opportunity to pick leaders. And here's a summary of your leadership. Your biggest single problem, Micah is saying, for the people of God in Micah's time, the biggest single problem in Micah's time was leadership. There is, they, they, are, they are completely corrupt. There are no role models, no inspiration, and no examples. He's saying the leadership is all backwards. I can't understand how I gave you the right to pick your leaders. I even anointed them or even ordained them. And this is what they've gotten. He says, listen, they've fallen short. They've missed the mark. And I'm sick of it now. You've broken our covenant. Now, what are you going to do about it? And they say to themselves, listen, what we'll do is we'll just bring to God a nice fat offering. We'll give him an offering. Okay? Look at what he says in, verse, in the next screen there. He says, so what, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before him? So I come before him with a burnt offering and with calves a year old? In other words, do people actually think they can clear up all of their disobedience, all of their wrongdoing, all of their injustices? They can clear all of it up by doing one thing. What is that one thing? They can just bring God an offering. They can pay him off. Listen. These are people who pay everybody off. Remember that? The priest is on a bribe. The prophets are on a price, right? The kings will rule for anything except for justice. So they figure that because the kings are so corrupt, the rules are so corrupt, the prophets are so corrupt, the priests are so corrupt, why don't we just pay God off with some sacrifices and he'll be happy and get out of our way? But no, God says, that's not what I want. And I'm not going to be bought that way. I'm not going to be, you're going to pay me up. this. I don't want, he says, in essence, let's go to the next slide real quick. He says, listen, he says, will you give me, will you give me a thousand rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Next slide. My firstborn, should I bow down? They say, in essence, is this. We now hear you, Micah. We hear what you're saying, but here's the deal. What if we give God a thousand rams, 10,000 rivers of oil, our firstborn, and then if we bow down, will that satisfy God? Listen to what this is saying. These people have lived with prosperity. They are rich, they are successful, they are prosperous. And because they have all of this, they figure what? The quantities of their transgressions can be swept away by the quantities of their sacrifices. All right? Because God has a price, but everybody else has a price, why wouldn't God have a price? Now hold that for one second and think about it. Is that familiar with anybody? All we got to do is give God a couple of hours a day, Give God this, give God that, and everything will be okay. We'll keep living the way we live. We'll keep worshiping the way we worship. We'll keep denying God our first of everything, but we'll just give him enough stuff so we feel good. You know what happens in this? We'll get religious. You see, we'll get religious without ever having to form a genuine relationship. And God says, I don't want your religion. I don't want any of that. What I want is your life, your relationship with me. I want you to obey my word. I want you to do what my word says to do. 
Let's go on to the next slide here. Then we'll skip this one. The next one says something important too. In Micah, he says, listen, here's what I want. Here's what I want. Human being, what is good? What do I want? What do I require of you? I require of you to practice justice, faithful love, and to walk rightly before me. That's what I want. I want you to practice justice, Micah 6 and 8. I want you to walk faithfully, and I want you to be faithful in love. In other words, making sure, when he says practice justice, I'll slide here, we'll conclude this by saying, practice justice means to treat people equitably. Giving people what they are due. And not just do it begrudgingly, but do it with love. Do it with faithfulness. Do it with compassion. This is what he means by that. He wants us to practice it and to do it with love and grace. It's amazing. It's what he's desiring of us to do. He wants us to be able, in essence here, to make sure that we're doing it right. Now, I, I, I want us to pause and think about that. Are you practicing justice? Are you doing it with love and kindness? And are you walking it, living it, whether people are watching you or not? Zechariah says this in the fourth chapter. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts. He says what? Render Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, or the poor. And do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Now, those were the primary targeted audience of people who got treated unfairly in these times. Look at the group. You have the people that go back to the other slide. One, go back one more second there. It was... The oppressed were widows, orphans, aliens, foreigners, poor, okay, who were being oppressed, who were being denied justice, who were not being treated equitably. Now what he says, get this right. So I took a moment and said, if we translate those words, those groups to today's time, look at the next slide. Here's what we have. We have voting rights. Health care issues, racial issues, refugee issues, poverty, economic issues, gun violence, hunger and food insecurity, child poverty, sexual trafficking, and elderly abuse. Those, if God, if, if Michael was here today, instead of saying what he said in the previous verse, he would say, get the voting rights, get health care. Get refugees taken care of. Deal with the racial issues the right way. Stop the gun violence. Stop poverty and economic oppression, hunger and insecurity. All these things are happening right now, and they are considered socially unjust. And there are issues that we as a people of God cannot be silenced about. But tonight I want to wrap up with this clipping, because here's what I'm learning about. It's another injustice. I didn't put up there. I'm going to use it to you tonight. It's called reproductive injustice. Reproductive injustice. It's happening in our lifetime. I'm amazed that as early, as far back, as recently as 2006, I'm going to share with you a story that took place in real life. In America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, we're going to see something that is absolutely amazing. In America, not a foreign country, not a, a, a tropical island somewhere, but right here where people, black women, women of color, are being denied justice of reproductive rights through deception and, and wickedness for a bribe, for money. Listen. California spent $150,000 to conduct a procedure, sterilize women against their knowledge of what was being done. It's criminal. It's criminal. It is criminal, and it's unjust, and it's today, and it's relevant. And why am I sharing this with you? I'm sharing this with you because we think that many of the issues of Micah's time are over, but they're not over. 
So I'm introducing to you today a whole new concept called reproductive injustice. And I wanted to say a few words on this, and we're going to stop to the clip. Now, it's important to keep in mind that I was introduced to this whole female issue around an incredible advocate for women's rights. Her name is my, my dear sister Aaliyah. Um, and she's just a, the sister of our minister, uh, Shoshana Walden. And uh, Aaliyah Baki, just an amazing woman, has a foundation in Brooklyn that advocates for women. And I, was, I had an opportunity about four years ago, three years ago, to spend time with her, had lunch together with her. And she was telling me about a, an initiative she was working on around female rights of the women incarcerated. You see, women break the law too, black women too, women of color too, they go to jail and serve their time, and many times in prison or going into prison, they are pregnant. So they're pregnant in prison, and when this particular case came up, uh, Sister Leah was telling me about it, it was just so moving to me that this, these women were pregnant in prison, so they come to the gestation period of nine months to deliver their child, and they go to the hospital. And in the hospital room, the delivery room, she was telling me about they were actually handcuffed to the bed. So here you got a woman in massive labor with the right or the left hand handcuffed with prison, male prison guards in the vicinity where they're screaming and pushing and screaming and pushing, but they can't move their arms because their arms are handcuffed. And her particular foundation was advocating to have these laws eradicated. I'm sharing that because of this. These women, they broke the law. They're serving their time. But should they be treated like animals at the throes of childbirth? Now, as a man... I know what I've read and seen firsthand, that there's no pain I will ever go through that compares to delivering a child. Tell you right now, I've seen it firsthand. I have been blessed to have two healthy children. I was there for both of their, their facing and, and their emerging. And I will tell you, I will argue with no one. There is no pain that men will ever experience that comes close to the pain that I was able to just envision when I saw this transaction. I can't imagine a female, a woman, a mother-to-be, handcuffed to the bed in the delivery process, in the labor process. Where is she going to go? Is she going to actually run? going to deliver a baby, and then bolt out the hospital room for freedom. But that's the inhumane treatment that is being done. This video clipping will share with you another inhumane, unjust, ungodly treatment of people in our day and time. Listen, we'll come back. It's an important clipping. Pay attention. Reproductive injustice. 20 minutes. Bear with us. God bless you. I remember just looking at all of the cows and the plains and at 19 thinking to myself like wow there's so much on this earth that I haven't seen and now I'm getting ready to go spend 15 years of my life in prison. Can you state your full name for the record, please? Kelly LaShawn Dylan Thomas. Dylan was your maiden name? Yes. I was sentenced for shooting and killing my husband. The most painful thing was when the police came to get me and having to separate between me and my children, even though I had protected us from a monster. The blue lights are the great husband? Yes. Yeah. And iron. And iron? Yes. And this occurred during a fight? Yes. And he put the iron up to your neck? Yes. I'm 
trying to remember what my children felt like, their skin felt like, what their breath smelled like. I cannot believe that my life has come to this. I always been a fighter, but it wasn't truly birth until I was in prison. It's always hard to figure out what to wear to prison because you can't wear red, green, brown, khaki, orange, or denim of any color. When people in prison have a visit, they have to go through a strip search and they have to expose themselves in front of at least one guard, if not many more. So usually visitors come in only wear black or white. And I decided at some point to bring a of levity and color to the visits. Folks inside loved it. They would see me coming and start giggling and laughing about what wild shoes I had on. There was this one correctional officer who was like, you can't wear those shoes. And I was like, can you point to the rule that says that these violate any kind of dress code? All the correctional officers and the high level folks from the Department of Corrections were always treating me like a small child. And so at some point I decided to just own it and take on the brand of kind of being like a, a tacky whippersnapper. Waking up and leaving the house before six in the morning and driving to prison and spending the day bearing witness to pretty significant trauma. It's really very draining. Whenever you're fighting human rights abuses in prison, you never know what to expect. The first thing I remember seeing, the girls yelling in the cells, and it just looked like top and bottom tier of cage animals. Everything was exposed. You have male officers who can actually look in the cell and see women sitting on the toilet, changing their pads. A few years later, I began to experience like abdominal pain. I was told I had a abnormal pap smear and needed a cone biopsy to look for cancer. The doctor said that it seems like I have cysts that was growing on my ovaries. He asked me how old I was. I was about 24. He said, do you want any children? I said, yes, I have two sons already. And because I'm not going to have a chance to raise them, I'm looking forward to meeting someone who actually loves me and raising more children. So he said, if I find cancer, do you want us to do a hysterectomy? And I said, yes, if you find cancer. So me and four other girls were called out to get chained up in order to go out for surgery. Everything's assembly line. We're all handed a piece of paper by two nurses. They're standing there like, you guys need to hurry up and sign. We're trying to read as much as we can to understand, but for the most part, we're looking and said, this is for you to consent to the surgery that you're having today.
when I came out, I felt like something was wrong. He told me everything is fine. We took out some sis. So then I asked him, will I still be able to have children? He was like, yeah, I don't see why not. Are you starting to actually get more hope though around your own case? We were getting hundreds of letters about horrible medical abuses every month. But then one day we got this letter from Kelly Dillon and it was really troubling. It's almost nine months past and I haven't had my period. I got bad panic attacks, heart palpitation, night sweats, and I'm damn near 100 pounds smaller. She was suffering all these symptoms that were classic symptoms of uh, surgical menopause, but she was a young woman in her 20s. Cynthia advised me, you need to get your medical records after six months of fighting to just get my medical records, Cynthia sat with me in the visiting room and she read them to me. It says is that you had abnormal cervical cells. I asked her, did it ever say I have cancer? She said, no, you never had cancer. I had been intentionally sterilized and I had been lied to. My name is Cynthia Chandler. I'm the co-director of the Justice Network on Women, which is a new organization based in Oakland that provides legal services and community organizing around the needs of women prisoners. When I got out of law school in 1995, I didn't know anything about anything happening in prison until really meeting people who were really living there who had to make prison their life. I'm HIV and Hep C co-infected. I'm self-disclosed. I had heard some bits and pieces about Cynthia. She was a young white woman, a Harvard grad, and Cindy came up to me, and I can't like even imagine what she's got to tell me. We're failing to provide the most basic care to the sickest and most vulnerable of the women who are in this prison system. She was an attorney for Compassionate Release, and I was like, Compassionate Release? Like, who does that? Like, who fights for somebody that's going to die, and you fight? to get them home. Many of us watched Rosemary Mary Willoughby die because the Department of Corrections refused to acknowledge that she was dying. Her worst nightmare came true. She died absolutely alone, surrounded by not a single person who she loved. She started making kind of sense to me how us women need to learn how to defend ourselves legally and how we need to find a remedy for human rights violations inside. It shouldn't be up to an inmate to have to sit and figure out what my T-cell count is and what it means to me. I watched two women die on my yard that I was very close to and that I knew. If I could see that the whites of their eyes were as yellow as a caution sign, why couldn't somebody else? Healthcare is so bleak, it's hard to imagine it's even by accident. Last year, there were about 150 formal complaints filed by inmates every month from allegations of incompetence to actual charges of sexual harassment. We have a health care staff who you go in for a cut on the finger, likes to give you a pap smear. <laughs> for a chest cold, no, let me you know, do a pap smear. I've heard inmates tell me that they would deliberately uh, like to be examined. The only male contact to get. You're well, telling me they're coming in here, in effect, asking for them? Well, some sort of titillation? It could very well be. It could very well be. California's women's prisons have always had a horrific track record of medical care. This Friday, Judge Felton Henderson delivered a ruling that charged deplorable conditions in state prisoner medical care. They had uh, doctors in what looked like uh, broom closets 
seeing prisoners and I went and saw them standing in line the ceiling was dripping water and they were standing in a half inch of water waiting to be seen the federal courts took over the whole health care system for California's prisons and placed it under federal receivership to bring the health care up to constitutional standards. You know, people would say, well, how dare, you know, a receiver or somebody come into our house and tell us how to do things. CDC is punishment. And there was a lot of pushback on adding rehabilitation to just CDC and making it CDCR. They really saw the receivership as a threat. I worked at the Central California Women's Facility for about 17 years. People that do things for inmates are that try to ensure that they get their care. They're called inmate lovers. You're an inmate lover. I have some fear. What kind of repercussions will I get for coming on and talking about this? I took an oath when I graduated from nursing school and it said you do no harm. But that means become numbers. You don't get names. And that's what makes it easy to abuse them. I was sitting down in the middle of the yard. I see this um, young African-American girl walk out of the medical building and she's holding her abdomen area. And I see, I know it's not my business, but what kind of surgery did you have? She said, I had to get a partial hysterectomy. I said, for what? She said, oh, they said I had abnormal cells. And then that's when whoo, the light bulb went off. Why is it all of a sudden we got all of these reproductive problems? That's when I was like, oh, nah, this don't sound right. I made a phone call back to Cynthia. I think that they've been doing this to other women. I started carrying a briefcase with form so I could help people contact Justice Now. Thanks to Kelly's organizing, we were able to uncover a dozen instances of people being sterilized during other kinds of surgeries. Bruce in the Hopkins, thank you for meeting with me today. So if you could summarize what happened in terms of the surgery you had. I put in a request to see the doctor because I had bad cramps and he said you have fibroid tumors and severe endometriosis so that causes a higher risk of cervical cancer. He talked me into a hysterectomy. Four years later I went to an OBGYN doctor. I asked him did I have tumors and endometriosis? And he said, I don't see any of that on here. You gave me hysterectomy for severe cramps? He did a pelvic exam. He gave me some kind of test and said I had some uh, fibroid. I was told that I had cancer cells. They told me that I had to have my ovaries removed. I had no choice. We actually used to call them the surgeries of the month because they were happening so frequently. So many people were getting hysterectomies. That was a cure-all, that's what it was. It's usually impossible to find representation for people who are harmed in prison because the cases are both too difficult and too costly, and no attorneys will take them. In Kelly's case, the harm was so egregious that we were able to secure pro bono one of the best law firms in the state to represent her. Although the fight was in me, I was very much intimidated by whom I was going up against. I saw that you had a number of health issues after surgery. I felt like I, I was losing a lot of weight at the time. I was in a lot of pain. I thought that I was dying. What did you weigh when you went into prison? 
like 235 pounds. What was the least that you weighed? 118 pounds. And the doctor thought maybe I was a hypochondriac. And he said that, um, that I should be happy that I had weight, lost weight. So many women would love to have lost the amount of weight that I've lost. One doctor told me, well, how do you expect for someone to um, treat you if you are um, suing them? Um, I'm going to bounce around on that. Other than the offense that you're currently in on, uh, did you have any other uh, convictions? No. The circumstances that led to your current incarceration, tell me about that. Did you take a break? We would have a recount everything about her commitment events because they're looking for evidence of her being someone who lies, of her being someone who is lacking of character. How many times did you receive medical treatment for injuries you suffered as a result of domestic violence? Numerous. I can't. I don't. I don't. I don't have a specific number. Can you give me an estimate? Five, ten, twenty. You know, my heart had already been broken. Uh, my spirit had already been crushed. It was, I didn't, I didn't have nothing to lose. My attorneys postponed the trial until I actually paroled. I felt like I was going to get a real chance at, I don't know, I just thought that like maybe this was the beginning of the tables turning. The smoking gun in her case was that they cut off the blood supply to her ovaries and removed them, dissected them, and they were never supposed to do any of that. They knew that your ovaries produced the eggs and, and an egg was required to have a baby. Yes. In your complaint, it's alleged that if you'd have known there was a possibility that your ovaries might have been removed during the surgery, that you would not have consented to it. Yes. Was the plan that if he found cancer at surgery, that he was going to, at that same surgery, do a partial hysterectomy? Well, that was my, that was my understanding. She consented to removing everything, if and only if she had cancer and it had spread and was invasive. She didn't have cancer. At any point while you were at Madeira Community Hospital, did anybody tell you that all of your ovaries had been removed? No. What was the first time a doctor told you that you may be missing your ovaries? No one ever told me that. No medical doctors ever said that? No. Thing. The jury was predominantly white from Fresno County. I'm looking at this jury hoping that they would say this is wrong no matter what or why she was there, she didn't deserve this to happen to her. After a seven day trial, the jury believed the doctor's versions of events, that Kelly knew something was wrong at the end of the surgery, that she then missed the time she had to bring a claim under the statute of limitations. And they used that to just dismiss all of her claims. I watched my lead attorney, as well as her team, walk out the room and tears begin to roll down their eyes. And I just looked at them and I said, thank you for fighting for me. Even if it was just for the fight. Question 43. If you found for plaintiff on any of her claims and found that those claims were not barred by any statute of limitations, what total damages do you award Ms. Thomas? Zero dollars. Zero dollars. Zero dollars. I was looking at these documents that was confirming that as a black woman, my life wasn't it didn't mean anything. It had no purpose.
I really couldn't enjoy my coming home. My mind was in a trial for the first three months of my freedom. This photo album I kept with me in prison. This is my favorite picture. That's me coming to visit me in prison. Out of the 15 years I was there, we had about five visits. When I left, my sons was two and four. So I'm watching my children grow up on the other side of a glass. It was hard. When I came home, they were 16 and 18 years old. I began to hear from my children. You didn't have to go to prison, you chose to. I said, did they ever tell you that how much I loved you? Did they ever tell you of what I did in order to make sure that a hand was never laid on you? I posted this up on my Facebook and it said, this is what domestic violence looks like. Looking at this picture, you can never see that I was a victim of domestic violence because it looks like we're madly in love, you know? Amen. Amen. Excuse me for that lengthy program tonight, but I thought it was so important for us just to take a look and see how social justice is unfolding in our day and our generation. We can always point back, and if you're like me, you were probably pretty young during the 60s, during the Civil Rights Movement, and have no idea what Jim Crow really was like in the South unless you were uh, uh, around at that time. But I look at this issue, reproductive injustice, and I look at the life of a young woman named Kelly Dillon, who is serving her time, spent her time in prison, and expected to be treated like a human being was denied that privilege, was lied to, was mistreated, was stripped of her ability to reproduce and have a productive family when she got released from prison years later. I'm a big fan of PBS and in my car I found a PBS, I'm a big fan of public radio. I listen to it on a regular basis right now and I'm learning so much and I came across this whole story and she was being interviewed and I learned a couple of months ago I, sent, I believe that reparations were actually done for the women like her, those black and brown and yellow feet that we saw. There, w there was a reparations done, and there are certain laws being I in implemented now to prevent this from ever happening again. But in the meantime, there are other courses that we have to take a position to. And I invite the people of God, I invite the lights of the world, the city that sits upon a hill, the salt of the earth, to take a position to speak our voices, to join courses that make sense, to join courses that have been depriving people of their justice and their rights for years. Let's not sit dormant and watch TV and find something entertaining to, to delight ourselves with. But let's take a position as a body of Christ. Our pastor is working now ferociously implement a 501c3 organization for fellowship where we're going to go out in this community right here in the South Bronx, right here on Castle Hill Avenue. Our Community Cares Initiative is being put together and we're hoping to go out soon and do some things that really create an attentiveness and awareness to changing the course of people's lives by ensuring that justice, equitable treatment is being given to our people. That was the message of Micah. That's the message of Jesus Christ, who said, I've come for the brokenhearted and the poor to proclaim the year of liberty to those that have been in captivity. So I invite you to stay tuned, to stay prayerful. These are not times to be entertained, to fall asleep in la-la land, and to soothe ourselves with a new melody. These are times to get on fire for God and take a course of action to bring God's voice to these situations in these times. I've taken more time than I normally do. We wrapped up Micah tonight. We'll start next week in, in, in Nahum. Before we do that, I want to invite you, if you have an offering, you can join us by transmitting your offering gift. Amen. You, you, know, the, you know the drill. We have FCC for the vision. We have Cash App. 
We have Zelly. Please send your offerings in to continue to bless our ministry of Bible study and the ministry of the Fellowship of Covenant Church. We need your tithes and your offerings and your gifts, and we thank you for them. Join me now as we pray and close out. Father, we thank you. We bless you for bringing these matters to our attention. Now we pray. We, your people, who you've given us power to be your witnesses in Samaria, in Jerusalem, in the uttermost parts of the world to today, in 2021, you would help us to be your witnesses in the marketplaces, in the hospitals, institutions, in the schools, in housing developments, oh God, wherever we go, to cry out for justice, to mobilize prayerfully for righteousness, to let no one go punished unnecessarily in any way, Lord, that justice would be served in this country while we serve here as alien residents. Oh God, knowing this is not our home, we wait a new, ba a new place, a new home. But while we're here, help us to be voices of righteousness in a dark world, we pray, Father. And we thank you for the words of Micah, the words, oh God, of your prophet who said to do justice, to love, do it in loving kindness, and to walk humbly before our God. We ask these blessings tonight, Father, and we thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We are closing. Have a wonderful night. And again, thank you for giving me this extra time tonight to share this riveting message of Micah and this riveting course of reproductive injustice that we, the people of God, must take a position upon. God bless you. Have a good night.